What are you scared of? Suffocating in an enclosed space. Corpses, gaping wounds, blood. Or how about being buried alive in one of the world's deepest mines? We've been pumping oil out of the earth since the 1850s. But it took another 30 years' worth of engineers to work out how to drill oil from the seabed. There's a new problem. How to stop the platforms crumbling into the ocean? Enter someone who can descale an oil rig. This is commercial diving with a twist. Kim Young is the supervisor. She and her 20 crew are on intimate terms with a decompression chamber. There are female divers. I'm the only female supervisor that I know of. There may be some others, but uh, I haven't heard of them. My role on this ship is to uh, oversee the job, um, operations, and to make sure nobody gets hurt. Kim's team is stationed in the Gulf of Mexico, where there are more than a 1,000 rigs needing urgent repairs. Good morning, everybody. Everybody did a great job yesterday, uh, more in the boat. We had, uh, that was pretty dangerous stuff. You guys did it safely. Keep up the good work on that. Kim uh, notched up nearly 20 on years on her personal dive log. She's obviously not scared of water, but she has a healthy respect for death. Dive hose ended up getting ignored, and that's the most important hose. The death rate for a commercial diver in the USA is 40 times higher than the average worker. That's why every day in the briefing room, the communications drill is top priority. Okay. If you lose communications in the water, then we will get somebody down there to you. Just do an OK sign in your video. We'll be looking at it. Have a great day. <laughs> Go to work. Commercial divers use uh, surface supplied air. They have that means they have a hose that goes to the surface. They have constant communications um, with the surface and one diver in the water at a time. With dives to 90 meters, planning is everything. Today's task is inspecting a 20 year old rig. Salt water is corrosive and metal will rust much faster in seawater than in air. Oil was first found thousands of years ago, simply seeping out of the ground. In the modern world, we have to go to great lengths to extract the four billion tons or so that are used every year. Yeah, Believe it or not, there's a word for being afraid of work. Ergophobia. Not something these guys suffer from. Yeah, you're fault. Once you know your anode from your elbow, you can earn 80,000 euros a year. We discovered uh, during our swim-by inspection that all of the anode for the platform were all eaten up, and those need to be replaced. And that's real important because the corrosion starts very quickly as soon as the anodes are gone. Zinc anodes work like a protective coating over the steel to slow down corrosion of the rig. But it's not enough. That's a uh, underwater sandblast, what we call the ocean clean system. Basically, the guy will go and he'll clean a uh, select node, which is a, a node is where different members come together on a leg. He'll clean it down to bare metal to where we can do a thorough inspection of the welds on that member. So other piece here, this is a flooded member detector. Basically, the guy will put it up on the member to check to see if the member is flooded. If it's flooded, we'll get a big spike on that screen over there. OK, this is our uh, underwater magnet. It's got a magnetic field. You stick it onto the metal, basically, and it puts a, uh, a magnetic field through the piece that you're working on. We take the powder, which is an underwater powder. We mix it in there, and if there's a break in that somewhere, this stuff will get sucked right into a crack. 
After a two-year apprenticeship, you're allowed to do repairs 100 metres down in low visibility. This is our air hose. We'll hook it to the diver's hat. He'll have air continuously. This is his communication wire. There's uh, ear speakers, microphones. We can talk to him in the dive shack with this. You're not even moving it. Nah. Somebody rotate that camera. Jacob, as you look at it, it needs to be rotated clockwise. Keep going. All stop. Despite the precautions, there will be an average of five deaths a year. How do you live with the thought that you could be next? The average rig repair diver isn't the worrying type, or they'd never do it. This job involves spending hours underwater, chipping away at the barnacles, coral and seaweed that have grown on the metal supports. We need to walk the horizontal diagonal from B1 over to C2. As you walk this member, I want you to go past the x brace go over that debris and bring your hose with you, okay? Roger. He's into a surface decompression, so what we're going to do in a few minutes is uh, he'll come up on surface, get out of his hat quickly, walk back there to the chamber and get in the chamber and have about an hour and 11 minutes uh, decompression in the chamber. Whenever you're doing deeper diving, what happens is, is your body fills with, you know, nitrogen bubbles, and basically the chamber is pressing those bubbles out of your system. If he didn't go through the decompression chamber, basically those air bubbles that gets in your system would not come out and he would get bent. He's got uh, three minutes to get from 30 feet in the water, up on deck, walk across the deck, and get to the chamber. The chamber should save his life. The bends shows itself in many ways. Pain in the joints, confusion, loss of consciousness, tremors, and in more extreme cases, loss of bladder function, paralysis, even cardiac arrest. This diver will have to wait two hours to find out if he suffered any lasting damage. Most commercial divers retire young. It's safer to reinvent yourself as a supervisor, like Kim. This certainly wouldn't suit anyone claustrophobic. But if your greatest fear is the nine to five, then with at least six months off a year, it might just be attractive. If enclosed spaces aren't your problem, then working in the deepest underground spa in the world could be for you. But first, fear of dying. Thanatophobia to you and me must be almost universal. And the thought of being murdered at the hands of a psycho is worst of all. But for one man, this scene is a day job. In his chamber of horrors, in deepest, darkest Buckinghamshire in the United Kingdom, Neil Gorton has a job to end them all. He is a prosthetic makeup artist with a particular talent for death, horrific injury, and the plain weird. <laughs> How are we doing, guys? Let's have a look. After 19 years working for the film industry, Neil is top of his league. I started off, I was, I was basically a weird kid. I just, I love movies, and I started to, to see special effects. You know, it's, it's like you see a monster or see an alien, and you think, how's that created? And it's like, well, somebody does that for a living. I'd like to do that for a living. Everything I do is weird, whether it's killing people, whether it's making monsters, whether it's people's heads explode, whatever it is, it's all weird. Yeah. 
Neil is a veteran in an industry where most people burn out after just a few years. So far, working on Gladiator and Saving Private Ryan have been his biggest perks. All the prosthetics we do with the makeups and things like this all start with a cast of an actor's face. So at the moment, this is, this is a cast of um, an actor and his face is being, that's the original plaster mold and we've splayed it out and we're gonna make silicon on top of this. 40 TV projects a year, three to four major films. This is a job of long hours and constant deadlines. The latest gig, a commercial, where an old lady races a top athlete. We're creating makeup over a younger performer um, who is actually an athlete, a lady who's in her 30s. And we're going to do a whole prosthetic makeup to make her look identical to the old lady. I think part of me is also, I love magic, you know, I love the illusion, I love the, the idea that someone looks uh, a face with a prosthetic on or a makeup on and doesn't see the trick. First pregnant man. People don't even think about when they're watching shows, you know, it's like someone just gave birth, fine. And it's like, well, it's like with the babies and things like that, you can't, can't just do that for real, you know, you've got to fake it. So, and this is what we do, everything we do, we're faking it, you know. In this job, you need to be able to dream up new ways to push the boundaries. So you'll have had clamps holding the skin open here, and you can see as you move, you know, it just moves like skin. This is for a, a fake chest of someone that he's lying on a slab in a mortuary and someone begins to cut and blood starts to flow because it turns out the man's still alive. His studio forks out for half a tonne of latex and two tonnes of clay a year, but the rewards are good. The great part about this job is it's never the same twice. You know, every makeup is different, every person you work on is different. Dream job for Neil, but someone else's nightmare. Okay, what should we do to you first? For Neil, even creating a car crash victim can be uplifting. A little bit of adhesive on there. Press that on. OK, so that's it. You've really got to love it. You've really got to want to do it. And it, it isn't about the money. It's not about fame and fortune. It's just about loving what you do. And all the people who come in thinking, oh, that looks like a bit of fun. There's still a lot of hard work involved. And if you're not prepared for that hard work, they tend not to last very long. Neil couldn't have learned this at school, in Liverpool as a boy. This little bullet wound there. Becoming the best takes bucket loads of talent and lifelong dedication to your art. Neil was 10 when he first got the effects bug, watching Star Wars and Sinbad movies. Now his time's worth around 90,000 euros a year. The kind of golden days of the film industry where people were getting paid big fat salaries when movies were made for millions and millions and millions of dollars is kind of going past us now. Not just the models suffer for art in this trade. You want a bit of glass, do you? Why not, eh? The major downside is zero social life. I've done commercials where they, they've just shot for 25 hours straight. You know, I've started at 5 in the morning, done a makeup, shot all day, right through till staggering back in the hotel at 5 in the morning. And it's a killer, you know? Your personal life suffers. I think the film industry has got some like the highest divorce rate of any industry in the world. I've done makeups that have lasted six, seven hours. And it's very tiring. Neil now has up to 25 people on the payroll. But in this business, ultimately, it's his name on the door and his reputation on the line.
this job can bleed you dry if you let it. It just looks like fun and three in the morning on a cold mountain somewhere in the middle of nowhere, freezing to death, rain and you haven't slept for two days and you've been working all night, you suddenly think, where's the fun? <laughs> the fun is knowing your work will be seen on the big and small screen by millions. But this is a trade where competition is fierce and where the commitment can be a killer. Unless you possess artistic hands, an engineer's mind, and are definitely not necrophobic, don't try this one at home. When it comes to fear factor, the next job has it all. For the last 800 years, only the toughest have survived here. The salt mine at Falaszka, near Krakow, in Poland. Operational since the Middle Ages. Stanislav Aniol became a miner in 1968. These days, he also has another, more creative job title, sculptor. Hundreds of men have died down here. Their ghosts are still here, but they protect us. Since it opened, hundreds of men have dug the salt out of a maze of 300 kilometers of caverns. Spectrophobia. Yes, there really is a word for being scared of ghosts. If you suffer from this, don't work here. I remember my first trip to the pit. My father took me along to the heart of it, the chapel of St. Kinga. You come down the stairs and suddenly you see the whole thing. Down here, everything is made of salt. The floors, the figures, the lusters, the altar, everything is created by the miners. Stanislav's not the first miner to turn his hand to sculpture. The Kinga Chapel is 10 metres high, 54 metres long and 15 metres wide, all hand-carved over the generations. To call this a mine now misses the point. It's a cathedral. Stanislaw chisels alone in the dark for hours on end. For another phobia, try tapophobia, fear of being buried alive. Where we are standing now is very secure because of the modern technology used. These chambers can't collapse. However, I do still believe that the ghost of the pit is protecting us. People have bungee jumped, taken balloon flights, and even windsurfed on a salt lake 100 metres down in these mines. It's dangerous work. In 1992, a river flooded the nine levels and many men were killed. Now, this World Heritage Site is a place where people come to be healed. Tourists keep to the beaten track. The salt lakes and salty air in the chambers contain large quantities of sodium chloride, magnesium and calcium ions, which are said to help treat as many as 36 illnesses, ranging from asthma to infertility and from skin diseases to obesity. The caves aren't natural. They're the result of thousands of blocks of salt being removed over centuries. In 
it's good that such a big mine still has a lot of people on the payroll. Many others have long since closed. A million people a year now come to see the carvings and hear the stories. In the past, every time a miner died, other miners would plant a cross at the same spot, so his family never forgot. Through the centuries, over a dozen underground chapels have sprung up. These angels over here are cut into the salt walls. Slowly but surely they wear away and there's nothing we can do. It's really heartbreaking to see. Stanislaw has also managed to reinvent himself again, this time into tour guide. Multi-skilling makes more money. The paycheck is around a thousand euros a year, which is good, but only if you're not afraid of being down here, including surophobia. That's fear of mice, by the way. You only find mice where there's no danger. They can sense when there is danger. Miners never kill a mouse because they protect us with their senses. Over 3,000 people have been treated in the resort in the last 20 years. be able to don a hard hat and say you've gone down 200 metres to one of the world's deepest mineral spas. <laughs> Having spent more than half their lives down here, the miners must be some of the healthiest in the world. And no one who has spent decades underground can have phobias about the dark or ghosts. Who knows? Working in a tough environment could cure some of your fears too. Mining is no easy option, but this trade does have its softer side. This is salt. It's grey like a stone, but when you illuminate it, it shows its true beauty. Stanislaw says that learning how to sculpt the salt is like learning how to handle a woman. Both are fragile and erratic. After a long day underground, he heads to the surface, leaving the visitors to dream up monsters among the statues in the caves. You'll never see this trade advertised in a job centre. But if you did, it would list artistic ability, being good with people, and lack of phobias as must-have qualities. Not bad for a miner. They say you can cure a fear by doing the thing that scares you. Three trades offering healthy doses of claustrophobia, haemophobia and scotophobia. Go look it up. <laughs>